Well, good morning, church family. Can we stand together as we sing, as we worship our great God together? God has given his son the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is born. And that's exactly what we're here to do. We lift up and exalt the, the wonderful name of Jesus. Can we sing together all hail the power of Jesus' name? Let's sing together.
Eternal, immortal, invisible to the King. Eternal to the only wise God. To the King. Eternal, immortal, invisible to the King. Eternal.
Claim that together as your, as your family, as a body of faith. Thank you for the truth that we just proclaimed, that we just sang. It's in that name that we pray, amen. You can be seated. Um, again, we're so glad that, they, that everyone is here this morning. And I think one thing that we can never do enough of as a church family uh, is encourage one another and pray for one another. And I, I want to tell you that in the 8 o'clock service this morning, Every single person in there prayed, especially for this time. Everyone in this room, you've been covered and you've been lifted up to our Father in prayer. So I'm gonna encourage you to do the same thing. Worship Center, 930. Pray for the, the group, our, our family, that's gonna meet in this room at 11 o'clock. Pray that the Holy Spirit will move, work powerfully among them. That it will speak powerfully through Mike. The lives will be changed. You know people will be in here that will be struggling with faith, um, anxieties, whatever is going on in their lives. I pray that God will speak in a special way to them this morning. God's called us to love, encourage one another, to lift each other up in prayer. So let's do that right now. Let's pray together. All the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for the peace that you have given us, your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you for hearing us. Thank you for hearing the prayers of your people. We know we did nothing to deserve that, but God, through your sacrifice, we can approach your throne and know that you hear us and know that you love us. God, we lift our empty hands to you. Ask that you fill them with the grace, peace, and love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Middle Tennessee is as lost as anywhere in America. There are little boys and little girls in Middle Tennessee that because of where they were born and the county they were born in and the family they were born in, they have no chance. They won't be able to break that poverty cycle unless the church engages in that. You look around, you read the paper, you pay attention, and you wonder where you will even start. You may already be in the mission field where God has called you. Most people stay right 
where they are. God uses those people who have no name, no stature, to be the very one he anoints so that when they show up, you have to know it's a God thing. Will I be open and available to be used by Jesus Christ however he needs to use me for the sake of his kingdom? So where do you start? Well, that part's easy. The door you walk through is the door that Jesus has already opened. Why aren't you engaged in the work that Jesus has called this church to do? God is up to something. Let's make sure we're right in the middle of it. We used to call it the great day of service. Do you remember that? And all of our life groups, Sunday school classes would have a project for the day and we'd spread you out uh, throughout to Brentwood and Franklin and Williamson County and you would do a certain project for the day. But now with six campuses, we are covering a lot more area and there are a lot more opportunities. Uh, it's, uh, there are four, four or five that are mentioned in the information that you were given when you came in. Uh, f- there are a lot more opportunities than that. Uh, they're all out at the, uh, the, the desk there in the atrium. And we want to know that you're going to be here so we can make sure that you get a good place to, to get plugged into. So if you turn that uh, information over, you'll see a sign-up uh, card there for you. And you will help us by letting us know that you're going to be here and we can make, uh, make a good connection. Now, let me tell you why this is important. Uh, now, I'm a lifelong Southern Baptist, never been anything else. And because I is one of us, I can talk about us. Now, if a Presbyterian runs down Baptist, then I'll stand up and fight. But um, this is just family. You know we're good at giving an invitation. Nobody's better than giving an invitation than Southern Baptist. We can get babies born into the kingdom of God. Now, what we don't do a good job of is growing those babies up into mature men and women of the faith. Uh, But... We have emphasized evangelism to the point that the world isn't listening to us anymore. They're waiting to see if we will make a real difference in the real world in which they live, and then when we do that, then they'll listen. So when you show up to paint the room of a school or to help the librarians restack some material, uh, when you help to uh, work in a food bank, or uh, in a ministry that provides clothing to those who can't afford uh, clothes on their own, or if uh, you're tutoring a young student in the afternoon or cleaning up a neighborhood park, people begin to watch what's going on over there, why are those people over there, and we have a chance to tell them about the love that God has for them in Jesus Christ. The ministry comes before the message now. That's why this moment is so important. That's why the MDU is so important. The medical dental unit is so important because it does real good in the real world and that gives us the opportunity to tell people about the love of God. So don't underestimate how important April 8th is. So engage Middle Tennessee on April 8th. All of you have a place to be engaged with that, and you'll find more information there. Now, we're able to do this and respond to all the opportunities that God opens for us because of your generosity, because of your faithfulness to God's teachings about the tithe, because of your generosity, uh, responding to His goodness to you. We have the resources we need uh, to do this kind of ministry that opens up opportunities for evangelism. So if you join us in Baskin Chapel and Overflow, we're glad to have you and the ushers will be coming there uh, to serve you even as they come now and serve in the main sanctuary. So let's continue our worship through our giving. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, receive the gifts of your children for we give them with great enthusiasm and excitement, eager to see what you will do. We have so much to celebrate from what you've done in our past. And that gives us great confidence for what you will yet do. And we don't want to miss a thing. So take everything we are and everything we have and use it to the glory of your son's name. For it is in his name we pray and live. Amen.
excited to introduce you to Kylie Diffie, who is a seventh grader at Woodland Middle. She's the daughter of Joe and Teresa Diffie. And Kylie and I have had an opportunity to talk over the last several months about what it means to invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. And um, even months and years before that, her mom and their neighbor, Susan Morton, have been talking and praying with Kylie about what it means to have Jesus as Lord and Savior. And just recently, she said, you know, I knew the answers in my head, but it, it has um, in my heart finally connected and clicked. And so today she stands here professing that Jesus Christ is Lord of her life and celebrating that she walks with him in eternity, for eternity. Kylie, is it true that you've invited Jesus Christ to be Lord and Savior of your life? Yes. Upon that profession of faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We continue our series, The Gospel According to the Book of Judges, and I want to remind you that we came to this series out of the personal Bible study of Jay Strother. Uh, Jay is the pastor of the Station Hill uh, congregation and deals a lot with uh, a lot of young couples, young marrieds, uh, and, and began to notice in his reading of Judges a lot of parallels. Uh, the book of Judges ends with a, with a painful sentence uh, that the, in that day there was no king in Israel, so everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Uh, and as he read that, and as he read this cycle that keeps repeating itself in, uh, in the book of Judges, he recognized a lot of the things that he was dealing with. Uh, in, in the lives of, of his own people. So we put together this, this book, this sermon series based on the book of Judges, knowing that a lot of you have not spent a whole lot of time in that book and that it would be fun for us to preach and, um, and, and good for you to experience. Now, when you start preaching from the book of Judges, the first thing that happens when you read the book of Judges is you recognize how violent this book is. I almost feel like it needs some kind of PG rating, like I need to put some kind of sign up going that the following sermon is based on a scripture passage that can, contains adult things, graphic violence, and, and that I need to warn you. In fact, one of the conversations, that one of the things that happens when you have a conversation with a person who's not familiar with scripture or who is not a believer, one of the objections they will bring up is that, boy, how in the world can you worship a God who sanctions that kind of violence, uh, who is responsible for those kind of things. And they'll quote a lot of the stories from the book of Judges. It is a violent, um, uncomfortable book. And you wonder, how in the world are we going to get a redeeming message out of this? Well, I want to remind you of an obvious fact. Yes, the Bible is a book about God. The Bible is also a book about us. Do you wonder where the violence comes from? Are you shocked that there would be? Well, just before you get on your high horse about how we're now so much more sophisticated than they were in the time of the judges, let me remind you of a few things. One, there were 762 murders in Chicago alone last year. 762 murders. Now, before you go, well, that's Chicago. We know about Chicago. Who wants to live in Chicago anyway? That's why we live here in Nashville. Nashville's murder rate increased 83%. AIDS organizations tell us that 17,000 children have died in the Syrian conflict. 17,000 children. Now, depending on which organization you're talking to, they will place the number just under 400,000 or just over 400,000, but you can feel pretty comfortable with using the figure 400,000 people have died in the Syrian conflict. Now, just in case the news isn't enough violence for you, uh, we turn violence into a form of entertainment so that by the time a child is 18 years old, they would have witnessed 200,000 
acts of violence, 40,000 of them murders. So just in case the evening news isn't enough, you can stand by and watch how to kill people and wound your friends. And we'll show it to you on television. Oh, I haven't even mentioned, uh, did you see this past week where they found a, a mass grave in Mexico, part of the cartel and the drug war there, and mothers are digging through this grave, this mass grave, trying to find their children? I haven't told you about that. I haven't mentioned the, the uh, multiple nations in Africa that are facing an unprecedented food crisis. Millions upon millions of people because of civil war, because of drought, will not have enough food. I haven't even talked about that. Need I go on? Here's the bad news. The bad news is things haven't changed that much. We're still the same old, same old. Here's the good news. God is always working, and He's working now. And that's what we find out in the fourth chapter of the book of Judges. Stand with me as we read this chapter, the story of Deborah and Barak. Now the Israelites did again what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehu had died. So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, the and he reigned in Hazor. The commander of his forces was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth of the nations. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord because Jabin had 900 iron chariots and he oppressed them for 20 years. Now Deborah was a woman who was a prophet and the wife of Libidoth, who was judging Israel at the time. It was her custom to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel and the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites went up to her for judgment. Now she summoned Barak, son of Abinoam, to Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, Hasn't the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, commanded you, Go deploy the troops on Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the Naphtalites and the Zebedonites? And, the, and the, he will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's forces, his chariots, and the army to the Wadi of Kishon to fight against you, and I will hand him over to you. And Barak said, I will go, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. I will go with you, she said, but you will receive no honor on the road you're about to take, because the Lord will sell Sisera into a woman's hands. So Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh, and Barak summoned the Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. Ten thousand men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now Heber, Heber the Kenite had moved away from the Kenites, the sons of Hoab. Mother's, uh, Moses' father-in-law, and pitched his tent along the oak tree at Zananim, which is near Kadesh. Now it was reported that Sisera, to, to Sisera that Barak, son of Abinoam, had gone up to Mount Tabor, and Sisera, and Sisera summoned his 900 iron chariots and all the people who were with him from Horosheth of the nations to the Wadi Kishon. Then Deborah said to Barak, Move on, for this is the day the Lord has handed Sisera over to you. Hasn't the Lord gone before you? And so Barak came down from the mountain t Mount Tabor with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord threw Sisera and all of his charioteer uh, charioteers into an ar an, uh, his whole army in confusion with the sword before Barak. Now Sisera left his chariot and fled on foot. And Barak pursued the chariots and the army as far as Herosheth of the nations. And the whole army of Sisera fell by the sword. Not one man was left alive. And meanwhile, Sisera had, f had fled on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite, because there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazor, and the family of Heber, the Kenite. The Jael went out to greet Sisera and said to him, Come in, my lord, come in with me, and don't be afraid. So he went into her tent, and she covered him with a rug. And he said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. So she opened a container of milk and gave him a drink and covered him again. And then he said to her, Stand at the entrance of the tent. And if anyone asks you if there's a man in here, you say no. And while he was sleeping from exhaustion, Heber's wife Jael went and silently to Sarah, and she hammered the peg of his... Uh, she went and took a tent peg, grabbed a hammer, and she hammered the peg into his temple. 
and drove it into the ground, and he died. And when Barak arrived in pursuit of Sisera, Jael went out to greet him and said, Come, and I will show you the man you're looking for. So he went out with her, so he went in with her, and there was Sisera lying dead with a tent peg through his temple. And that day God subdued Jabin, king of Canaan, before the Israelites, and the power of the Israelites continued to increase against Jabin, king of Canaan, until they destroyed him. This is God's word to God's people. Hear it, believe it, and live. Let's pray together. Such a confusing, violent, hectic, crazy time. You gave your word to Deborah and Barak. So we pray in the crazy, violent, hectic time that we live in that you would give your word to us. And we pray we'll be as faithful as they were. We pray this in your name. Amen. Yeah, that's a problem when you read about eight versions of that Bible story, then you try to read one, and they're still running around in your head. Wow, what a story. What in the world are we going to do with this story? Uh, a guy's laying dead with a t tent peg, and you feel like this is a, 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 some kind of Jerusalem CSI, uh, where they walk in going, oh, I think he's dead. I think so? What? With a tent peg through his head. How long ago do you think he died? So we're going to do run some blood tests, see who did it. Got any fingerprints? No, the woman who killed him standing right there. She's confessing. What a story. What are we going to do with this? Well, let's go back to the first of it. Okay, stop me if you've heard this. Israel is in slavery. Okay, is that, we see we come to back to this point again and again and again. Uh, the, the people of God end up uh, worshiping false idols, disobeying God, angering God, displeasing God. He sends some foreign power to oppress them. They are oppressed. They're in slavery. They call out to God. God liberates them. And they live in some, some time of freedom. Uh, at the end of this story, it's about 20 years of freedom. Um, then they will get uh, sloppy uh, they'll lose their attention. They'll begin to worship the other gods. They will become disobedient to God and will start this cycle all over again. Now notice, the people go into slavery. They cry out to God. God delivers them from slavery. They enjoy their freedom. It is not the slavery that breaks them. It is success. Every time the people of God got to a place of peace, got to a place of success, that's when their spiritual attention wavered. That, that's when they suffered some kind of spiritual ADD. They began to look at other shiny things. And they began to think that the credit belonged to them. See, I deserve this. I earned this. And rather than seeing their life as a blessing from God, that's when they got into trouble. Not when they were going through hard times, tough times. Success is harder to negotiate for a person of faith than struggle. It will be success that trips up most of us. Not some great test of the faith. It will be when things are going well. And the cycle starts all over again. This is chapter 4. And look at all the judges we've already been through. Joshua's died. After him was Ehud, uh, Othniel, uh, and then Ehud. And then I love this one, Shamgar. Sounds like a video game character, doesn't it? And then Deborah and Barak. Chapter 4, we've already been through all of these guys. And we're about to start this story all over again. We're not finished. We've still got Gideon to go through. We've still got Samson to go through. You would think that this cycle would get tiresome, but it doesn't. They keep going through it again and again and again. Doing well, losing their worship, losing their uh, spiritual focus, winding back up in slavery, and we start all over again. What in the world are we going to take from this? What are we going to do? Well, here's the first point. God will not allow his people to stay in slavery. 
God will not allow His people to stay in slavery. Now, it may be another government. It may be a, a, a different theology, a different religion that oppresses the people of God. It may be capitalism. It may be some, something that, that, that hinders the people of God from their worship or from their preaching. And whatever that is, God will not tolerate it long. Now, we always, because we teach history in such a, 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 a happenstance manner, you may get the idea that Abraham Lincoln started the Civil Rights Movement. He didn't. It wasn't the Republican Party that started the Civil Rights Movement. It wasn't the Democratic Party that started and supported the Civil Rights Movement. Friends, it was the church. The first leaders of the Civil Rights Movement were not politicians, they were preachers. It was the sermons that got the people to march. And when they marched, they sang the hymns of the church. We Shall Overcome is a hymn. The Democratic Party didn't write that. The church did. God will not tolerate His people to be in slavery. Whatever, whatever it is is holding you slaves. Now, some of you are slaves to your job. Now, now, what I mean by that? Does anything else or anybody else have the final say in your life? Does anybody else or anything else have the final say in your life? Here's what I mean by that. You know God is speaking to you. You know God is talking to you. You know God is calling you to a certain task, a certain de decision, a certain uh, line of obedience, life of obedience. Okay? You know that. And you're thinking about doing it. But you can't. Because of this, because of that, because you owe too much money, because the job has you tangled up, uh, because of a bad relationship, uh, because you have some kind of addiction, uh, pornography, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, name your addiction, name your drug of choice, but there's something else in your life, there's somebody else in your life. That, so when you hear God calling you, you're going, I would, but. I'd love to, but. Does anybody else or anything else have the final say in your life if someone else or something else has a final say in your life, you are a slave. You can't make your own decisions. You can't follow the Spirit when the Spirit leads. You are held captive. Hear me. It is not God's will that you live in bondage. The gospel is about freedom. The freedom to be all that you're created to be, all that you're called to be, all that the Lord desires for you to be. Now, you know how you can tell inauthentic love from authentic love? Okay? Uh, people come up to me and go, how, how will I know if he really loves me? Here, here's the test. Are you more you when he loves you? Or are you less you? You see, if somebody authentically loves you, there is an unfolding of you. Uh, there is there, there, there is an uh, expansion of you. You're more of who you are. You have a freedom about you. You have a joy about you because you're safe in this person's love because you can explore. You can find out more about you. I am more Mike because of the way Jeannie loves me. She is more Jeannie because of the way she loves me. Authentic love always expands always makes you more. Inauthentic love makes you less. Okay? Now, you know some people in some relationships where the, where the guy's really jealous or, or the girl's really jealous, and so they're always afraid they're going to make the other person mad, and they end up living smaller lives. You see, it's never God's will for you to live that small. That tied up. You're not supposed to live in slavery or bondage. You're called to live in freedom. And that means something. That means something else. 
Point number two, God's always talking to somebody. Now, I love this story. Deborah calls Barak. Hasn't God told you to get the army together and go to Mount Tabor? Yes. Yes, he has. But I'm not going unless you go. Really? Now, you're thinking like I think, right? Oh, God, if you just tell me some direct word, if you just speak to me like you talk to the people in the Bible, I will do what you tell me to do. Promise. Maybe. Okay? Barak knew what God was calling him to do. Get an army together, get 10,000 men together, go to the mountain, and I will deliver the enemy into your hand. Isn't that what God told you to do? Yes. But I'm not going. Unless you go. Now, there are a lot of people get upset, da 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 you know, women in ministry, ya da 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 And here we got Deborah, she's a prophet. What do you do? Well, here, here's the bottom line, all right? Break it down for you, Alabama style. God talks to whoever listens. Barack wasn't listening. Deborah was. Now, okay, Barack heard, but Barack didn't do. So if you don't obey, you didn't listen. Listening to the word is always revealed, always shown by obedience. Now, there's some other little things here, too. One, Barak would have been fine had he come to Deborah and said, I've heard the Lord say to me, get the army together, and Deborah could have confirmed that. Okay? This is an important point. God never just talks to one person. He always confirms or affirms the word through somebody else. Okay? A lot of us get in trouble because we think we hear something from God and it's not validated by the church. Okay, now that doesn't mean you have to stand up on Sunday night and say, here, everybody, I believe this is, this is what. No, it does mean that there's two or three people that you do life with that you know the, know the Lord well. They've shown it over here. Who will give you honest feedback about how God works in your life. I've got friends who love me enough to laugh in my face. Okay? Because I have an idea a minute, you know that. And every now and then I'll say, hey, you know what we need to do? And they'll look at me and go, <laughs> you got to have friends like that in your life. Because if your friends don't laugh at you, the world will. And it's better that your friends do it. <laughs> okay? He could have done that. There's always a confirmation. There's always an affirmation. There's always, as it, and you see it in the New Testament all the time, it seemed good to the church. And the church confirmed, affirmed the word that the Lord had sent to the person who's speaking to them. He could have done that. He didn't. He wasn't going to go to the battle. And the people would have stayed in slavery if it was left up to Barak. You and I don't get that sometimes. That sometimes when we're disobedient, sometimes when we're not brave, sometimes when we're a coward, when the Lord calls us to do something, other people suffer because of our disobedience. Amen. Maybe God is talking to you. I, whoa, whoa, I know, I know what you're saying. Whoa, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. If God's going to use somebody, he's going to use somebody famous, he's going to use somebody powerful, he's going to use somebody connected, he's going to use somebody deeply spiritual, he's going to use somebody, hold it, hold it. Okay, let me, I'm going to put those names of those judges back up there. Joshua, Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar. Unless you're an expert in biblical trivia, you didn't know who those guys were. Okay? You didn't know them. Yet their, their name is in the Bible. It's pretty impressive. You didn't know who Noah was until God called him. You didn't know who Abraham was until God called him. 
Abraham was a 75-year-old teenager living with his mom and dad. Okay? Not the kind of guy that you would want to start a nation. He wasn't famous until God called him. Would you have called Peter? Would you have called Paul? For that matter, would you have called Mary? You see, the theme of the Bible is that nobody is famous, nobody is strong, nobody is a victor until God calls them, until they're obedient to God's call in their life. Paul reminds the Corinthians, none of you were anything until Jesus called you, which means when you hear the call of God in your life, and your first response is, I can't do this. I don't have fill in the blank. I'm not smart enough. I'm not, I'm not connected enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not wise enough. I'm not educated enough. Whatever your enough sentence is. If your first response is, I can't do this because I am limited, then that's validation that you are well equipped for what God wants to do. Because you always start with, I can't, so God can show you that He can. Amen. Maybe God is talking to you. You remember how Paul ended the letter to the Ephesians? The first part of the letter is, first three chapters is great theology. And then in chapter 4 he says, now because of this live a life worthy of the calling. And he talks about how we are to express the, the, the reality of the gospel in our lives and our relationships in our, and in how we live in the city and the, with the governments and all of that. And then he says, put on the full armor of God. Pull on the full armor of God and get in the fight. Because God is not going to allow His people to stay in slavery. He's going to call somebody. And maybe that's you. Now, this is one of those sermons where everybody needs to do something with it. And for some of you, the response is as easy as getting out a piece of paper right now and writing on it, today I will. Do what God is now laying on your heart to do, what God is now impressing on your mind for you to do. Listening is always determined by obedience. To know and not do is the same thing as to not know. Understand that because of your disobedience, because of your hesitancy, somebody else is paying the price. See, Barak was not going to do the, go to battle. Because of his disobedience, the people had continued to stay in slavery. The battle should have taken place earlier than it did, but Barat was disobedient. So maybe your response is as simple as writing down, this is what I'm going to do. Now, some of you will be embarrassed that it's such a small thing. And it may, and I'm not kidding you, it may be literally, I need to call a friend and check on them. They haven't been in a life group lately. I haven't heard from them. Uh, last time I heard they were going through a hard time. I need to call and check on them. It may be that small. And you're going to say it doesn't matter. Have you ever gotten one of those calls? Hmm? You ever gotten a call where somebody said, I don't know why, but God laid you on my mind? I was praying for you. Don't tell me it doesn't matter. Faith is like any muscle. It has to be exercised. 
And maybe in that one thing, God is going to teach you about the next thing he'll ask you to do. Okay? Some of you have not done lesson three because you won't do lesson one. Do whatever it is, however small you think it is, just do it. And let the Lord teach you what he wants to teach you so he can get you ready for the next one. Some of you know exactly what the Lord wants you to do, and it's a matter now of saying, yes, I'll do it. Two, some of you, some of you have known something's wrong this week, didn't know what it was, couldn't name it, and now you're here, don't know how you're here, a friend invited you, you can't, saw the church, pulled in, whatever, but you knew something was going on in your life, didn't know what it was, and now you're hearing me say that it is not God's will that you be in slavery or bondage, and now you know it. Your life is determined by decisions that other people make. And you're not free. Now, I don't know what holds you slave and enslaved. Uh, I don't know if it's addiction. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if it's idolatry. I don't know. Here's what I do know. It is not God's will that you walk out a slave. You may have walked in a slave, but you don't have to walk out that way. Jesus died to pay for those sins that hold you hostage. In his death, he cleared that debt. In his resurrection, he gives you a life, a life of hope, purpose, joy, strength that you didn't even know was possible, but is yours simply because you ask, and he will freely give it to you. Now, I know I'm saying a whole lot and a handful of words. That's why our ministers are out of the table uh, called next steps. Just go and say, hey, I want to know more about what Mike was talking about. They'll pick up the conversation from there. For some of you, it'd be as simple as becoming a member of the church. You need to get involved with some people. And the, you know, the thing about Engaged Tennessee kind of caught your eye. You need to be in a place with the people who are making a difference. We'd love to have you in as part of this church. Now, you're right. This is an ugly story. Sisera, the general, ends up with a tent peg through his head. Oh, let's not feel sorry for the guy. Okay, this guy was a drug lord. This guy was a terrorist. This guy was any of those people, those lists of people that we sit, come on now, be honest with me, that we sit around, we read the paper, and we go, ah, somebody needs to do something. Somebody needs to kill that person. This was a gangland-style execution. If you live by the sword, you die by the sword. Live by the tent peg. <laughs> it was the life he chose. It was the death he chose. It wasn't God's will. It's never God's will that people live in that kind of slavery. You may have walked in a slave, but you don't have to walk out. And God's always talking to somebody. He may be talking to you. This story doesn't have to keep ending this way. It can have a new ending. And the resurrection gives us that power. Let's pray together. God's always talking to somebody. Maybe he's talking to you. Whatever it is now, you do it. Lord Jesus, our hearts are open, our lives are before you. So we pray now that the choices we make be exactly what you want. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Can we stand as we respond to God's word to us this morning? Let's sing together. Come behold. 
the wondrous mystery slain by death the god of life but no grave could e'er restrain him praise the lord he is alive and what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope Christ Christ in power resurrected as we will be when he comes. Let's take that truth with us as we go. Dismissed.